Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here today. We were a little concerned because the north side is really winning today. I feel like I should just stand here and talk to you guys. But now that there's a few on the south side, I can face everyone. It's good to see everybody. Susan, thank you for coming to play today. It's always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> Announcements, prayer requests, praises. Anybody got something for us? Where's Ruth Ann? I know she does. Oh, but she's back there. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, well, our Bible study will be continuing. We had a wonderful turnout last week, and um, it's called uh, Jesus Wants You to Follow. Or, so it's following up on David's messages, and that's today, after church, after coffee hour, from noon to one, and then on Wednesday nights from seven to eight at our house, the Parsonage. So... Anyway, that's going on, and then my big news is we're going to have a, a ladies' brunch uh, uh, coming right up on April 2nd. I know it's April, but it's right around the corner, so we haven't been able to do this in over two years, so I'm very excited that we'll be able to gather together as women, and we have people from our church participating. Susan will be speaking, and Tammy just said she can play, and Brenda Posey's playing, so we'll have a just a wonderful morning of fellowship together and getting in the word a little bit. So, and if you bring a dish to pass, we'll have lots to eat too. Thanks, Ruth Ann. Who wants to follow that? Don't everybody raise your hand all at once. Oh, here we go. Okay, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Megan McComb, I'm Richard's wife and Florence's daughter-in-law, and the Lord gave me something this morning I want to share. Um, last night, we went to a wedding. It was a beautiful wedding, a simple ceremony. It was a girl that we've known for 20 years, one of my daughter's best friends, and a man I had not met until last night. And as, as we went to the reception, um, I was watching the groom, and he was dancing with his bride, and he couldn't take his eyes off her. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And I had a chance to talk to him for about 15 seconds. And I said to him, Emily is a very special girl. And he looked at me with this look on his face. It was earnest and it was sincere. And he said, I know she's special. That's why I snatched her up. And I didn't really think about that until this morning. And it came back to me. And I started to cry because I thought, that is so sweet. And then I thought about how marriage is a mystery. It says in the Bible. And the church is the bride of Christ. And he's our bridegroom. And I thought, wow. And I thought about how 
Love makes you do crazy things sometimes. It makes you give your life away, you know, and commit to somebody till death us do part. And the craziest thing that love ever made anybody did do <laughs> was when Jesus took the cross so that we could live forever, so that we could be in his arms someday at the, at the wedding reception. And so he could look in our eyes and say to us, I am the one who will love you forever. And so I just really wanted to bring this and say that your bridegroom, your heavenly bridegroom doesn't just love you. He adores you. He is crazy in love with you. And <laughs> my mind just went blank. <laughs> and he, um, he loves you. And, that, and he knows how special you are, and that's why he snatched you up. Amen. Thank you for that. Now, who really wants to follow that? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, well, not seeing any other hands. Susan? Just a closer walk with thee. Thank you, Susan, for uh, picking a prelude that goes right along with my thoughts for today about following Jesus. We've been uh, spending some time this month considering what it means uh, to listen and obey those words of Jesus when he said, come, follow me. Uh, following him will lead us to the place where we want to go. Eternity with Jesus and the Father and with all who know him and love him forever and ever. That's where we're headed, that's where we're going, but we don't exactly know how to get there. We have to follow him. We have to keep our eyes on him. We have to walk with him closely and he will lead us to the place where we need to go. I have some verses about following uh, from Deuteronomy, from John, and from Ephesians this morning for your call to worship. Walk in obedience to 
all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land you will possess. The Lord himself will go before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands, obey him, serve him, hold fast to him. When Jesus spoke to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then Paul writes in Ephesians, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Following him is what it means to be a Christian. It's not uh, belonging to a certain church or even uh, being a member of a church. It's focusing on him, getting your eyes on him and following him wherever he leads you. You do this uh, through prayer, through studying the word, through listening to his voice. Prayer is not only talking to God, it's also listening to him speak to you. And so I encourage you to follow him wherever he may lead you. I'm glad to see that many of you remember this week to spring ahead with your clocks and the testament of that is that you're here this morning. You got up early and you got out and came to church to worship God with us. Thank you so much. And uh, some of those who may not have set their clocks ahead may be joining us now on Facebook or YouTube, or uh, you may be joining us later on Facebook or YouTube if you forgot to set your clocks ahead. But thank you for coming out on this cold morning and making a commitment to follow him and to add your voices to our voices, your prayers to our prayers, your praise to our praise, your worship to our worship. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we're just grateful that we can come into this place and to take some time and worship you. So we come humbly, we come gently, we come reverently, we come well aware that we have sins, failures, we have our own way of wandering and doing things our way so many times instead of following you. But Lord, we invite you to come here to us this morning. As we come in this sanctuary to worship you, we invite you to come. We ask for your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. We have this assurance that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So won't you come this morning? with your forgiveness, your mercy, and grace as we come humbly to you. Won't you hear and answer our prayers as we lift up those who are near and dear to us. Lord, we thank you for Joe, uh, Maple, and uh, the answers to prayer that she's already had, but we continue to lift her up in prayer to you for health and healing, for successful surgery, and uh, that she'll have all the help that she needs. Uh, be with Sierra, who is uh, facing surgery soon, and uh, ask for peace of mind and for uh, the opportunity to just trust in you and, and, and be close to you during this next part of her journey. Be with Mark, who uh, is still having dialysis and dealing with uh, treatments, 
we continue to pray for his kidney to start working again and to be healed and to be made whole. We lift up Joyce and Dan to you and Janet and Jenny. Be with them in the nursing care that they're receiving. Be with Peter who is now in nursing care as well and Melody who recently had surgery Pray that you'll be with her uh, during this time of healing and recovery. Continue to lift up Jen's mom, as well as all those who have the diagnosis of cancer uh, and are going through treatments. Uh, Lord, be with her and be with each one of them. Be with our dear uh, sweet Pat, and uh, who is has gone to the doctor and will go to the doctor again. We pray for a good prognosis and that they'll be able to uh, do something that will help her be as strong and um, just as, as vital and strong and healthy as she can be. Be uh, with her. We lift her into your hands and into your care. Lord, we're, we live in a troubled world a world that needs your peace, your presence, your mercy, your grace. The, the wars of men uh, disrupt this peace. But we pray for those who are being affected by this war that's going on right now. Those who uh, have no power, no electricity, no food, no medicine. And now they may have lost their homes, their shelter as well. Be with those who are uh, refugees. And Lord, I pray um, as we support those ministries that uh, provide food and care and shelter, uh, may they have enough to give to those who are now homeless or wounded because of this war or who are suffering loss. Lord, we pray that hostilities will end and that you would bring peace to our world. How much we need Jesus and his love and his grace during this time. How much we need those who follow Jesus to shine the light and share his love in this troubled time and in this troubled world. And now, Father, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Won't you take a moment this morning to say with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, amen. Thank you so much for uh, joining me in confessing the tenets of our faith. This time I'd like to invite the children who would like to, to go to children in worship as we prepare to sing a couple of songs. We're gonna start with number 629, Only Trust Him.
Thank you for joining me in that song. I wasn't sure if you would know that song or not, but it kind of is what I'm talking about today when I say that uh, sometimes God leads us where we don't want to go. At this time, won't you join me in singing the doxology as we offer our gifts to him? Father, we're grateful for all that you have given to us. Friends and family to love, houses to live in, food on our table and clothing to wear. You provided for our every need, and we are grateful. And we just want to take a moment to say thank you and to offer a portion of what you've given to us back to you to be used for your glory. Use this money, Lord, to feed the hungry, to bring clothing to the poor, to shine your light and share your love in this place, in this community, and around the world. Pray as we dedicate these gifts to you that you will multiply it and use it for your glory and that the name of Jesus will be lifted up in this place. In his name we pray. Amen. Just take a moment, won't you, this morning and greet somebody on the other side of the church or somebody nearby. Just take one or two moments to say good morning. This north side of the church is much more raucous than the south side, I've noticed. (laughs) As always, it's a pleasure and honor and a privilege to be here with you this morning and have the opportunity to share God's powerful and precious word with you. I say this because it's God's word that's made a huge, tremendous difference in my life, and I'm confident that God's word, as you hear it, as you believe it, as you study it, as you follow it, as you obey it, God's word will make a difference in your life, too. With God's Holy Spirit, he will take his word and bring about a change and transformation in your heart and life that will last not for a moment but for all eternity. So it's always a privilege and honor and a pleasure to share his word with whoever I can. This, we've been talking these past few weeks about what it means when we take seriously the words of Jesus, where he says, come, follow me. Jesus spoke those words to uh, Peter and Andrew and to James and John and to, I believe, to all of us. At one time or another, he invites us to come to him. And he invites us to follow him. And that will make a tremendous difference in your life if you will hear those words and take him seriously. Take him at his word and make a commitment in your heart and life to follow him. This idea of following God 
is not new with Jesus. Before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem, the idea of following God uh, is found in the scriptures way, way back. You remember uh, God appeared to Abraham. He said, he said, come, go to the land that I will show you and I'll give the land to you as an inheritance for your children. And Abraham got up, left his home and went to the promised land, went to the land of Canaan, went to the land that God had showed him. Later on, uh, God led the children of Israel, the children of Abraham, down to Egypt to save them from a famine that was coming. Now, his methods for leading his people down to Egypt, uh, might, uh, one might call it into question, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, was in prison in Egypt, and it was only after he interpreted the dream of Pharaoh in which God was warning Pharaoh. He said there are going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And God sent Joseph to Egypt by way of, a, of being a slave so that the right man would be in the right place at the right time. Pharaoh exalted him to number two in all of Egypt because Joseph knew what to do to prepare for the famine, to build storehouses and to harvest the, all they could in the years of plenty and save it for the lean years of famine. Egypt was saved and so was all of the house of Abraham as they came to Egypt to buy food. Later on, the people of Egypt forgot all about Joseph and all he had done for them, and they enslaved the children of Israel. Not very grateful for what Joseph had done for Egypt. They said, here's some free labor, and they put the people of Israel, the children of Israel, the descendants of Israel into bondage. And then God sent Moses to lead the people out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Egypt, back to the land of Canaan, back to the promised land. Of course, the children of Israel. Even though they cried out to God to deliver them from Egypt and to deliver them from slavery, they didn't like being led through the Red Sea and led through the desert and led through the wilderness and led into battle against the, what they called the giants in the land of Canaan. They rebelled against God and they spent an extra 40 years in the wilderness because they were unable to believe trust God and follow him. This brings me to my thought for today as we're talking once again about the cost of following Christ. Following Christ may mean going where you don't want to go. Sometimes God may lead you where you don't want to go. Now, he is leading us where we want to go to eternal life in heaven with him and the Father and all those who love him forever and ever. That's where we want to go. I'm up for that, I'm signing up for that. Take me there now, Lord. But sometimes the path to get there is difficult and challenging and we don't like it. I don't like it when I get a diagnosis of a sickness or illness or cancer or some dread disease but sometimes that's the path he leads us on. I don't like it when he takes me on the path of suffering or sorrow, but sometimes that's the path he takes me on. And that song, some through the fire, some through the flood, but all, all through the blood. 
You don't get to heaven. You don't get the promises of God. You don't get the glories of heaven unless you follow him wherever he leads you down here. And sometimes we don't like it. That's where the trust piece comes in. Trust him. Believe in him. Believe, get it in your head and in your heart that he knows what's best for you and he will lead you where you need to go and get you where you need to be if you will simply follow him. And I picked a very familiar story for our text today and I think most everybody has heard this story. I've heard it many, many, many times myself. Um, it's from Matthew chapter 14. This was a very long day for Jesus. It starts out by him withdrawing from the crowds. He needed a little private time, a little private time with just him and his father. He needed some time to pray, some time to be quiet. So they went to a remote place. It says they went there by, by boat to a solitary place thinking he'd get some peace and quiet and be able to pray and talk to his father. But everybody was following him. They followed him on foot. They said, oh, I think Jesus, I think they took the boat over there and they went kind of around the lake and the crowds came. And so when, when he saw the large crowds, he had compassion on them and he, healed them and he ministered to them and he spoke to them and they this went on for some time probably hours and hours and then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says uh, the disciples rather turn to Jesus and they say you know this is way out away from everything a remote place it's getting late send the crowds away so that they can get something to eat and Jesus just says well you give them something to eat well, we couldn't afford to feed all these people. And, and, and besides, all we got is a little boy's lunch here. Five loaves and two fish. And Jesus performs this miracle and feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. And then they has the disciples pick up the leftovers and then these people are still hanging around. You never have a, a, a church dinner, and then after the food's gone, people still hang around and eat, and they're picking up the leftovers and having another brownie or what. I, I mean, they're hanging around and hanging around, and, and, and Jesus knew the disciples were getting tired, so he puts them in the boat, and he takes time with the people to kind of dismiss the crowd and, and say goodbye to them and send them home. And that's where we pick up the story. This has been going on all day, and now it's into the evening. It says immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distant from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, and when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. 
Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful. Grateful for the gift of your word and the gift of your son and the gift of your Holy Spirit. As we consider your word this morning and the actions and the words and deeds of Jesus, won't you send your Holy Spirit? and bring clarity to our hearts and minds and speak to us through your word this morning. Open our ears, by your spirit, open our ears that we might hear, our eyes that we might see, and touch our hearts in such a way that we'll believe and receive all you have for us today. Help us to be faithful followers of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Following Christ may mean going where you don't want to go. Now in this text, uh, Jesus puts the disciples in the boat. I think it's interesting. He tells us the way that it says this. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. I don't know about you. Sometimes in my life, I get into these situations I get myself into these situations, I guess. I think, how did I get into this mess? I have to, to, to do something I wasn't planning on doing. I, I, uh, uh, I'm in a challenging situation. I'm then going, why am I doing this even? But then I think about the circumstances that led up to that, and, and I realize maybe I didn't get myself into this mess. Maybe the Lord put me into this situation. See, if you, it, it all depends how you look at it. If you realize that Jesus actually put you into this situation, all of a sudden, it doesn't seem so bad. And, and, and now, here's the disciples. He made them get in the boat. He said, go on ahead of me. Now, didn't Jesus know that there was a storm coming? Didn't Jesus know that uh, that was going to be difficult out there? The way the wind was blowing, there's going to be big waves, and, and, and they, the boat might even tip over or something happened to them. You know what? They were very concerned when they were out there in the wind and the waves. But they simply needed to remember that it was Jesus who made them get into the boat. And if Jesus puts you in the situation, it's going to be all right. He wouldn't have put them there if they weren't going to be safe there. Meanwhile, they're in the boat. He's dismissing the crowds. Uh, he Gets, gets rid of everybody and finally gets what he's been looking for all day long, some time to pray and talk and listen to his father. That's why they came to this remote place in the first place and there was just a little interruption. The phone rang, people came in, multitudes came. He ministered to them and he fed them and he listened to them, and he prayed for them, and he healed them. He fed them, and then he sent the disciples away, and then he sent them away, and then he got what he was longing for, time alone with his father. And I think he had a, it, it doesn't say how long it was, except that it does say when he was uh, done praying, it says shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. You would have think by now they'd have been all the way to the other side of the lake, but because of the wind and the waves, uh, it, they'd been working hard all night, rowing, this makes me think, I wasn't planning on saying this, it makes me think that we've gotten in a canoe up to the Adirondacks before and, and, and paddling around the, the, the beautiful lakes up there. I love doing that. And I give Ruth Ann a paddle, but she just kind of paddles when she wants to. 
And, and am I right? Okay, I, I, I want to, um, if, but if we're actually going to go someplace, I've got to kind of be in charge of steering and, and paddling. And after a while, that does get tired. I can't even imagine what it must be like to row against the wind like all night long. You'd be exhausted and then not really be getting anywhere. And it's at this time that Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And it's interesting, they said, uh, just before dawn, because if he went out there at midnight, they're not even gonna see him or know anybody's there. But it's just before dawn, it's like first light. And they can see this shadowy figure coming toward them and they think it's a ghost. It says, they saw him walking on the lake and they were terrified. It's a ghost and they cried out in fear. And of course, you wouldn't be expecting anyone you knew to be come walking to you on the water, especially the way the waves and the wind and everything. I mean, you wouldn't expect anyone. Of course, you might think it was a ghost. Of course, you would think there's something wrong. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Hey guys, it's me. It's just me, Jesus. I'm just out here going for a stroll on the water. Don't worry about it. Here I am, I'm here, I'm coming to you. I'm gonna help you. Now, I don't understand this at all because this isn't me. I'm not going to do this. But Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I don't know. These things that Peter does, it doesn't make any sense to me. But he says, tell me, if it's you, tell me to come on. What if it isn't Jesus? Isn't he still going to say, well, yeah, go ahead, come on out here. I don't know. If it's you, tell me to come. I wouldn't think of doing this. I'm in this boat, the waves are knocking it up and down, I'm seasick from being out here all night, I'm tired, exhausted. I'm not thinking I want to walk on the water. Maybe you think you want to walk on the water. I might want to walk on the water if it's perfectly calm and it's like glass and it's a beautiful sunrise or sunset, then I might, I, yeah, Jesus, help me walk on the water here. But when it's like that, but no, Peter says, but you tell me to come. And Jesus says, come. Jesus enabled, just Jesus speaking that word enabled Peter to take that step of faith and walk right out there on the water and start walking right to Jesus. That's an experience that almost nobody else has ever had. It says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. As long as he had his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. But when he looked at the wind and the results of the wind, the waves, the storm, he took his focus off of Jesus, he got afraid and he began to sink. I'm sure you've heard this story before. How important it is to keep your eyes on Jesus, especially in the middle of the storm and especially if you're doing something like walking on water. There's so many lessons that we can learn from this little story. But Jesus, he reaches out his hand, he catches him and says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It amazes me that Jesus says to Peter, you of little faith, because none of the other guys in the boat 
had enough faith to take one step onto the water. And I'm thinking nobody here had enough faith to walk on the water. And I know I don't have enough faith. And I was trying to think how I could demonstrate this. And the only thing I could think of is if I could find a puddle out there, I could go out and walk on the ice. And it'd be like walking on the water. But, that, but he says to Peter, little faith. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? There's so many lessons we can learn, but Peter must be commended for this because he made a decision. Back there, when he left the boat and when he left the nets, and Jesus said, come follow me, Peter says, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow him wherever he goes and whatever he does. I'm going to follow him. And if Jesus is walking on the water, I'm going to follow him. Peter had a really interesting personality. He comes to the Last Supper, and Jesus is washing their feet, and he says, you're not going to wash my feet. He says, if, you don't, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. Then he says, well, wash my feet and my hands and my head, bathe my whole body. Then he turns around a little bit later and I said, I'm telling you that one of you are going to deny me, betray me. Lord, everybody else may be deny you, but I'll never deny you. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Peter just had a desire to follow Jesus, to be everything for Jesus, but of course, like many of us, it's not that easy to always follow him perfectly. But Peter did get out of the boat and walk toward Jesus because he wanted to follow him. The other thing I think we could learn from this lesson is that if you're going to follow Jesus, you must walk in faith and not in fear. If you walk in fear, you will fall. If you walk in fear, you will sink. If you walk in fear, you will stumble. When you walk in faith, you'll be victorious. Walking in faith is required in following Jesus. And as long as Peter was walking in faith, he was able to walk on the water. And when he walked in fear, when he saw the wind and the waves and the storm, he fell. This past couple years has been a tremendous test for the people of God. And I've seen a lot of people walk in fear. Fear. Anxiety, anger, frustration. But there's a few people who've been able to walk in faith through it all. When you walk in faith, you're able to follow him. When you walk in fear, it's almost impossible to follow him. The only thing I can say is give your fears to him. Let go of them. Trust him. He will help you to walk in faith. Believe his word over everything else that comes your way. Don't follow the science. Don't follow your feelings. Don't follow Facebook. Don't follow your team. Don't follow anyone or anything else. Make a determination to follow Jesus, even though sometimes following Christ may mean going where you don't want to go. Now, Peter signed up for this. He said, Lord, ask me to let, bid me to come to you on the water. He may ask you to walk on the water. He may ask you to walk through sorrow. He may ask you to walk through sadness. He may ask you to walk through sickness. 
He may ask you to walk through suffering and pain wherever he may ask you to go. Know that he has your best interest in his heart and his mind. And wherever he asks you to go, he's leading you there. He's putting you in the boat and you will be all right, even when the storm comes. We want to get to where he was going. We don't always want to take the path that he asked us to take. But we've made a commitment. I've decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, I will follow. The interesting thing in this story, after all of the drama of the day, ministering to the thousands, feeding the multitudes, getting in the boat with the wind and the waves, Peter and Jesus get safely back in the boat. And now, the wind dies down. Now the wind dies down. Now they're back in the boat, and all of a sudden, the wind dies down. And when the wind dies down, the waves die down and settle down. Now it's nice and peaceful. Now I'm ready to walk on the water, Jesus. Now everything's calm. And they realize This is somebody really special here in the boat with us. If they didn't realize it before, they certainly realize it now. And so what does it say? It says, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. If they didn't know it before, they knew it now. When they saw him walking on the water, and now they saw him calm, the wind and the waves. You know what? It was only these few disciples who got to experience what these men experienced. They were following Jesus, and they were following him closely, and they were right there with him, and they experienced what nobody else did. Peter experienced what nobody else did. He walked on the water with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. And the others watched as Peter walked on the water with Jesus and watched as the wind calmed down. And they worshipped him there in the boat. Yes, sometimes Jesus leads us where we don't want to because it's worth it. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful. Grateful that Jesus speaks those words to us. Come, follow me. Give us a heart to follow you wherever you may lead us. Give us a mind that will be able to rationalize that if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is leading us, we can't go wrong. If God is putting us in the boat, we are safe in that boat. Help us, Lord, to follow you wherever you may lead and whatever you ask us to do. Wherever you ask us to go, wherever you ask us to do, Help us to be willing to listen and willing to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to his word by singing this song, Whatever It Takes.
Come, follow me. Wherever he leads, we should follow. He loves us so much, he came here to lead us back home to the Father who loves you so much. May the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence and power of his Holy Spirit be with you today and every day, all along the way. Amen.